Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. I appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, as I said before uh, in, the, in the intro, this was based on an article that was I originally wrote called Does Your Storeroom Layout Make Sense? And to be honest, when our marketing folks first approached me about doing the webinar, I, I wondered if the subject made any sense. I mean, after all, it seems like setting up and running a storeroom isn't really that complicated. Um, you know, most of the material in that article it seemed pretty straightforward and commonsensical to me, and frankly, I, I wasn't sure that there'd be a whole lot of value in using it for this webinar. But and then I started thinking about some of the storerooms that I've actually visited, and you know, wondered how they ever got in the shape they're in. And also started thinking about some of the clients that uh, our clients that had either moved their storerooms recently or had made what they thought were significant improvements, only to find out that what they had really accomplished was just transferring bad habits from an old location to a new one. So whether you're thinking about setting up a brand new storeroom or relocating an existing operation to a new warehouse or just making, just looking to make improvements in your current operation, I, I hope this presentation will give you some ideas about how to do that most effectively and efficiently. And hang on a second because I'm going to try and make sure that my slides are in sync with what you guys are seeing. Okay. So invariably, when, when we sit down with stores and purchasing people to draft a mission statement for materials management, it usually ends up looking something like this. It's provide the right parts in the right quantity to the right place at the right time with the right level of quality and at the least total cost to the organization. So if that's the case, then you have to ask, well, what, what part does a storeroom play in achieving that mission? So to help answer that question, let's look at the three main aspects of materials management, acquisition, control, and movement. The requisition of materials is generally triggered by a planner who determines the specific material needs. That would be the items, the quantities, and the required dates for each work order. The acquisition of this material is accomplished through, through procurement, which has the responsibility for ordering exactly what the customer wants from an approved vendor who will provide parts that meet prescribed specifications, often at the lowest price, but hopefully at the least total cost, considering all factors in addition to price. And after the required parts are received, the store's organization assumes responsibility for the proper handling and control of those items in the warehouse area until they're needed in the field at which point logistics arranges the movement of the material to its final destination when it's needed. So it doesn't sound like stores has much of an impact on achieving the mission, does it? After all, they're just the middleman between procurement and logistics, right? But don't be fooled. First of all, as many of you are probably thinking already, that in most organizations, material movement is actually done by storeroom personnel, which means that logistics is really stores. And second, the very fact that stores is embedded in the middle of the material flow means that they can potentially have an impact on every one of the elements of the mission. And how's that? Well, for instance, storekeepers can pull the wrong items or have inventory mixed in the bins. They can mistake stocking denominations, for example, pairs versus pieces, and, and pick the wrong amount. They can deliver material too soon or too late or to the wrong drop area. They can miss obvious problems with incoming material or even introduce defects into otherwise good parts through improper storage and handling. These all cause unnecessary delays, resulting in increased cost. So to successfully achieve the mission, everyone needs to fulfill their roles and execute their responsibilities consistently and accurately. But when we talk about roles and responsibilities, though, we're focusing on the human part of the operation. So there's no question that materials management relies heavily on processes, which are supported by transactions, which are performed at the end by people. But there's another aspect of materials management that's often downplayed or even overlooked, and that's the storeroom itself. Now, the storeroom, it's, the storeroom doesn't have a, a mission, per se, but it certainly has a purpose, which is to house materials in a safe, clean, secure, and organized environment. For many of our clients, these adjectives simply don't apply, but they should, and that's part of the problem. You can, you can have the best people and the best processes, 
but without a well-controlled and well-managed storeroom, you'll experience inefficiencies and other potential pitfalls that will ham hamper your ability to achieve the overall mission of materials management. So let's examine some of the situations that we run into and talk about some of the critical success factors in running an effective storeroom. First is infrastructure. One of the fundamental challenges we find is the condition of the storeroom facility itself. Many times the, the warehouse is nothing more than a building that was abandoned or recently cleaned out. And often it starts innocently as just a place to store some overflow materials. Maybe it was never designed to function as a storeroom in the first place. There could be holes in the roof, broken windows, missing doors, poor lighting, uh, faulty or even non-existent heating, air conditioning, or humidity controls, things like that. Storing materials in these conditions isn't really a whole lot better than just leaving them completely unprotected out in the open environment. Dust, dirt, corrosion, and other factors can actually degrade the quality of the materials to the point where they're at best compromised and at worst totally unusable. Your storeroom should be a place that people are proud to show off and want to work in, not a place that they're afraid to go. Location. Just because space is available somewhere doesn't mean that it's a great idea to go ahead and grab it up. First of all, having too great a distance between the storeroom and where the materials are needed can introduce inherent delays due to excessive travel time for your store's logistics personnel or highly paid mechanics, not to mention the opportunity for materials to get lost or damaged in transit. Second, if someone's willing to give up space you better ask yourself why before you decide to take advantage of it. This next slide shows some pictures from a building at a prior client site that was offered up to stores. It was probably a quarter to a half of a mile from the main storeroom, which wasn't exactly convenient to start with, and it didn't have any locks on the doors. In fact, it didn't even have a door on one side. But at least it was empty for a while. Twice they tried to clean it up, so that it could be used as a lay-down area for obsolete materials, but each time it got filled back up again with junk. This sort of stuff seems to happen a lot, especially right before a visit from the CEO or a scheduled plant tour. So you can just imagine what would have happened if they tried to use this building as a storeroom for good usable materials. It just would have been a total nightmare. And by the way, I, I, I kid you not, just last week I got an email from the storekeeper at this, at this site saying that one of their boiler house operators went to get something from this specific building, and he saw red eyes peering out from the inside. He, he swears it was a werewolf. Now, I don't think it probably, I don't think it was a werewolf, but uh, I don't know that he's going to be uh, that excited about going back into that building again. Next is accessibility. Our statistics show that roughly half of all MRO storerooms are open with an honor system in effect. And I'm sure you're familiar with the honor system. That's where everybody swears that they only take out what they need and they promise they're going to check it out properly. Well, that system can work, but usually doesn't. If anybody can get into your storeroom whenever they want and take whatever they want, then you probably don't have the necessary controls in place to ensure that those materials are properly handled, effectively managed, and accurately checked out. This can cause avoidable stockouts, which in turn can lead to expensive expedited acquisition and unnecessary delays in completing critical maintenance work. All of these result in significant increased cost to the, to the organization. Now, access doesn't need to be restricted because people are inherently dishonest. I mean, the storeroom doesn't need to be guarded or have a moat with alligators around it to be considered controlled. Besides, if people really want to get in, they'll find a way around almost any security measures that you can put in place. The problem generally is that they don't know what the procedures are or simply don't take the time to follow them. Employees need to be educated on the importance of adequate controls, trained on the proper procedures, and held accountable for having the discipline to follow the procedures to ensure that each item is charged to a work order or checked out accurately to keep your inventory correct. If generally, if people are empowered and accountable to ensure that a process is followed, they'll do their part. Next would be the physical layout. The physical layout of the warehouse may actually be, it may, may well introduce more potential inefficiencies into the materials management operation than anything else. 
So you need to ask yourself, is my storeroom set up for optimal material flow? And that involves a couple considerations. First, does material move quickly between areas? That is, from receiving dock to incoming inspection, to stores, to kitting, to shipping. And second, does material move efficiently within each individual area? In other words, is there adequate aisle space for people and handling equipment? Uh, are there a lot of dead ends? Have obstacles been removed? Those kinds of considerations. So as a case in point, let's take a look at this diagram, which represents the floor plan of the central warehouse at one of our prior client sites. Note the path required to move materials between the receiving dock at the front right of the building and the mechanical electrical stores area in the back left corner. This is a very large building with lots of available floor space, which is convenient. However, the size and layout also creates excessive travel time, which I hope we all recognize as one of the seven deadly wastes. So if the path of your material movement looks like this, or even like this, hey, then you're, you probably have a reasonably efficient setup. But if it looks more like this, then you might want to investigate some options that will improve the flow of the materials. It'll make your storeroom personnel more efficient and more productive, and that'll allow them to get more done in the same amount of time. So we just talked about the physical layout of the storeroom, but what about what I call the logical layout of the bin? Most people naturally gravitate to some form of the traditional alphanumeric row rack shelf system, like 1A1 or you know, B1C, something like that, which is good. That's, it's simple. It's easy to follow. Unfortunately, we've seen a, a lot of examples where this seemingly straightforward method doesn't quite work as well as it should. It's not at all uncommon for us to see rows A and B over here and rows C and D over there or racks numbered out of sequence, or even large gaps in the row rack and shelf designations that leave you scratching your head wondering what happened to the rest of the material. The way too many people use generic bin locations like floor, outside, boneyard, mezzanine. Now, while these might guide you to a general area, they often result in a random search of that area to find a specific item. We've also seen bin locations called gone obsolete, no bin, that have inventory on hand. So these are usually temporary designations for material that actually exists, but the problem is, how do you find it when you need to? Uh, and my personal favorite of all time is one that we saw called Bob. To this day, nobody knows who Bob is or where the location is, but there's supposedly something stored there. So maybe Bob should have left a treasure map or something so we could find the stuff that's there. Standardization is also a frequent issue. If, if rows are numbered from left to right in one section of one storeroom, then they should be done that way in every section of every storeroom. If racks are numbered from bottom to top in one place, then they should be from bottom to top everywhere. Bin labels should be attached in the same relative position to the bin, such as, for example, you know, always above the bin or always below the bin. A lot of times we see different bin identification schemes used in different parts of the same storeroom. And more often than not, we see one scheme in the main storeroom and another in the secondary or satellite storerooms. Now, this doesn't usually pose a major problem, but it can be a time waster, especially for new employees that are trying to get accustomed to the layout. And even those minors, the minor delays can add up. So consistency is important. Now, to be fair, few storerooms are ever intentionally designed as mazes with these cryptic identification schemes. It usually happens over time. And generally, as a result of having limited space, making wholesale relocation of materials, or lack of resources to make mass changes in your inventory control system when you move material from one storage media to another. But regardless of the root cause, the impact is the same. It's confusion, if not chaos. Visual management. I, I can walk into almost any Home Depot in the country, if not around the world, and as long as I don't get distracted by a greeter that's trying to hand me coupons, I can get myself oriented pretty quickly by just standing in the entrance area and looking at the aisle markers. 
my main objective is to get in, get what I need, and get out as quickly as possible. I, I don't like to waste my time, and browsing in a store like Home Depot can get pretty darn expensive. Now, obviously, your storeroom isn't a Home Depot, although we've seen many that are stocked just like one. But hopefully, if somebody needs something from your storeroom, they've taken the time to look up the part number, check the on-hand inventory to see if there's actually anything there. And they've also checked the bin location that it's supposed to be in, so they have an idea of where to go instead of just meandering around the storeroom like a blind squirrel looking for a nut. But even armed with that information, finding the actual location might be a challenge. Some storerooms are almost as big as a Home Depot or maybe laid out like a maze. So providing large visible signage to guide people around can be a helpful tool. It might be as simple as row identifiers, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, and so on. It could be arrows or signs indicating where specific sections of the storeroom are. For example, consignment here or vendor managed inventory over there. Or as in the case of Home Depot, uh, banners and placards that indicate the types of materials that are stored in each area. So, for example, chemicals, motors, fittings, and so on. Another great tool especially for occasional visitors, is a map of the storeroom that shows where each bin location is. Now, although this one's a little difficult to read, maybe a lot difficult to read, but this diagram shows an example from another client who posted large legible copies of these storeroom maps inside each of the storeroom entrances. If you look closely enough, you'll see that the map indicates where each type of material is located. It also provides a key to explain the bin numbering system as well as the specific location of each bin. So if you know what bin you're looking for, a quick reference to this map will guide you to where you need to go. Now, I know your storekeepers are the ones who spend the most time in the storeroom and after a month or a year or 25 years, not only do they know their way around, they probably know where every item is, how many are on the shelf, and how long they've been there. But your veterans won't be around forever. And you really should be thinking in terms of making it easy on the next generation. It shouldn't take a new storekeeper, or for that matter, any other person who's never been in the storeroom before, more than about five minutes to get oriented so they can find their way around easily. And don't forget that, although hopefully rare, there will almost certainly be those occasions when a mechanic, a supervisor, a security guard, or other authorized person needs to get material on an emergency basis when the storeroom is unmanned. The ability to respond promptly to these situations often depends on how quickly they can find the required part. The longer they spend in the storeroom, the more likely it is that they'll take something and forget to check it out, or remove a part from one bin and put it back somewhere else, or just waste their time. The combination of a well-designed and organized physical layout, an intelligent and consistent logical layout, and effective visual management tools will significantly improve the productivity of your storeroom personnel and others that need to access the storeroom to get materials. Now, a lesser but still important aspect of visual management involves the incorporation of dedicated areas into the warehouse layout for things like inbound materials waiting to be processed, uh, items that require inspection or quality checks, especially if they haven't passed or they need to be evaluated materials being returned to the supplier or back in the inventory, uh, repairable spares that have just been taken out of service, or even planned materials that are being kitted. The basic premise is that if there's material in one of these areas, the warehouse personnel will notice it, hopefully, and realize that something needs to be done with it. If the areas are empty, then that should indicate there's no action required. Now, Although this may seem like a potential waste of valuable space, it is helpful to have separate areas set aside for each type of material so it's readily apparent what, if anything, needs to be dealt with and specifically what needs to be done with it. Now, some people will challenge us that this system requires too much space, but actually the opposite is often the case. This type of visual management system keeps different types of material from getting intermingled. It also allows it to get processed and dispatched faster, which means there's less stuff sitting around taking up valuable space. Speaking of valuable space, one of the most common laments we hear from warehouse managers and storeroom personnel is, we're out of space. And sure enough, we often see pallets in the aisles, racks crammed to capacity or beyond, shelves buckling under the weights that they were never designed to support. 
overflowing bins, materials crammed into corners and cabinets. And after every available square inch is occupied, then parts get scattered elsewhere throughout the site, which really appears to lend credence to the claim that there's no space. Unfortunately, all that really does is make the problem even worse and mask the underlying issues. So frequently, lack of space is a perception rather than reality and has nothing to do with space at all. What it really involves is inventory control or generally lack thereof. So before worrying about being out of room, focus instead on utilizing the existing space effectively. First, throw out the trash and get rid of the clutter. Then segregate all the non-stock stuff, like files and Christmas decorations. I mean, somebody may have to keep them, but it doesn't necessarily have to be you. And really, this stuff shouldn't be mixed in with storeroom stock. Next, identify and dispose of your obsolete inventory. And then finally, review your min-max levels to make sure that you're keeping the right amount of stock on hand in the first place. Adjust the stocking parameters if you need to and reduce any excess inventory through usage, sale, or even scrapping it if appropriate. Remember that depending on your carrying costs and expected usage, it may actually be cheaper to throw stuff out or pay a restocking fee than to keep it in your storeroom. Once you've done all that, then see if you still have a problem. I, I suspect you won't, or at least you won't have as much of a problem, but if you do, then you can try to find additional space elsewhere suitable for proper control of material, of course, that can be used as secondary or satellite stores. Or you can consider other ways to optimize the area that you do have. For example, in some storerooms, as much as 50% of the floor space is unused or taken up with aisles. Material handling equipment is available that operates with as little as half the normal aisle width, which can increase the available floor space by as much as 10 to 20%. Transferring materials from traditional metal shelves to high-density cabinets can cut the footprint by as much as 50 to 60 percent for these parts. Also, there's often unused vertical space that can be accessed by double stacking cabinets, using high lift equipment, installing mezzanines or carousels, or other methods that are available. Now, if you decide to reorganize your storeroom, don't, don't assume that you have to do it all by yourself. Get some advice from a manufacturer or local distributor of racking, shelving, and storage systems. They can suggest solutions that will help you increase your available space and optimize your utilization. Many of them will even conduct an assessment and provide recommendations for your storeroom free of charge. And speaking as a Scotsman, cheap is good, free is better, so take advantage of it. Another thing to consider is whether you've allocated the right type and amount of space for each individual item. Based on your reorder point and reorder quantity, you should be able to accurately predict what your maximum inventory level will be. Knowing the size of each part and the approximate dimensions of the packaging that it comes in allows you to translate that information into an accurate estimate of the space that's required to contain it. You can then determine if the item will fit in available cabinet space or whether it would be better suited for a shelf or a pallet rack, something like that. This information is critical when you're establishing new items, but it's also helpful when you're consolidating inventory of the same part from multiple bins or when relocating materials from one storeroom to another or one storage medium to another. The key here is to ensure that there's just enough space set aside for each individual item to stock the anticipated inventory without having multiple bins for a single item or multiple items in a single bin or too much unused space. Some suppliers and manufacturer, manufacturers excuse me, will perform this type of space analysis as well, but albeit you know, probably won't be for free. They'll charge you something, but they'll actually incorporate your stocking plans into their recommendations for the types, quantities, and configurations of storage media that they think you should use. In fact, some suppliers will even customize the configuration of high-density cabinet systems to accommodate the specific items and quantities that you plan to stock, in some cases may even agree to do the initial stocking for you. Now, don't forget that you may need to expand. So target utilization for storeroom space is really about 80%. Any less than that, and you're probably paying for space, utilities, and other stuff that you really don't need to be paying for. 
any higher than 80%, and you risk getting right back into a situation where you have to cram material into every available corner, cubby hole, shop, and other place around the site. And last but not least, make sure all of your material handling equipment and supplies are maintained properly. And we see people struggle with broken pallets, chronically weak batteries on electric forklifts, parts with wobbly wheels, hydraulic pallet jacks with leaky seals, all kinds of other challenges that slow down the operation and just simply frustrate the storeroom employees. This stuff isn't cheap, and neither is keeping it all in good working condition, but the alternative can be much more time consuming and costly. You should have PM programs in place for your large material handling equipment that are just as effective as those for your production assets. But these situations don't create themselves, and they don't happen overnight. Obviously, people play an important role in every one of these areas, but it's not always the people themselves that are the problem. Often, it's just the decisions that some people make and others have to live with. So sometimes the storeroom's simply overlooked, it's been allowed to degrade over time, or it's been in a certain condition for, for so long that people simply accept it as the way it is. And what's become commonplace is no longer best practice, if it ever was, or even close to it, then the organization needs to review and maybe even revise the current practices and processes. So having a continuous improvement strategy may be the most important aspect of operating and maintaining your storeroom. The first step in reorganizing a storeroom or re-engineering the processes is to perform an assessment of your current situation. The assessment can be done by storeroom personnel or even people from outside the storeroom or the materials management organization who just want to provide you with some useful information that you can use to improve the overall operation of the storeroom. The assessment is an evaluation of the processes and practices, not the people, and that's important to remember. What we're trying to improve is the operation. We're not trying to be critical of the individuals who are stuck in this situation. The assessment addresses all of the elements that we've just discussed and more. Now, you know, views and opinions of certain areas and, and certain people will differ, and a lot of the results of an assessment will be subjective. However, the more people there are that point out the same issue, the more likely it is that it's something that really needs to be addressed. And more important than the assessment is an action plan. What are we going to do with this information? The action plan identifies the continuous improvement opportunities that are out there. It should describe the specific activities that need to be completed, how important they are, how long they'll take, how much it will cost, and who the key stakeholders are. Now, there's no guarantee that just because you submit or write down a detailed action plan that anything will get done. I can assure you, though, that without something like this, there's very little chance that anything will change. If, if capital or other funds become available for upgrades and other improvements to your storeroom, you have a much better chance of getting your share of the pie if you're already prepared with a prioritized list of the things that you want to accomplish. And some of those you may even be able to do yourself with the resources you have available. All you need in some cases is the commitment from your line organization or your management to support you in allowing you to do them yourselves. So with sound strategic planning and effective tactical execution, a lot of these challenges can be avoided, or at the very least, they don't have to be perpetuated. All of them can be fixed. We have lots of documented evidence of people that have made amazing transformations in their storerooms. Some of these can actually be done relatively quickly and inexpensively. Hey, some take more time, money, and other resources. But either way, if you don't proactively manage your storeroom, your storeroom will eventually manage you. I can guarantee it. So at this point, that kind of ends the, the presentation. I'd like to entertain any questions that may have come up.